This is a lockdown booty call. A lockdown booty call. Hello and welcome to episode 7 of Lockdown Booty Calls. My name is Robin Boot and in this episode I'm speaking with Darren Kenny OBE. Now Darren is one of the UK's most successful Paralympic athletes of all time. He's won 10 Olympic medals, six of them gold, and 17 world championships as a cyclist. We discussed how he had to retire at a very young age due to injury and what inspired him to get back on the bike and start competing again. We chatted about overcoming adversity, breaking world records, and controlling the controllables in order to succeed. We spoke about Estrella, his own bike brand that offers a truly bespoke service, how he's had to adapt and evolve during lockdown, and what the future holds for the brand. If you enjoy this podcast, please do go back and check out some of the other episodes and share it with someone else who you think may also like it. This is episode seven of Lockdown Booty Calls with Darren Kenny, OBE. Darren, welcome to Lockdown Booty Calls. It's fantastic to see you. Thanks for coming on as a guest. How are you doing today? Uh, Yeah, I'm great, thanks. So thanks for inviting me on. Uh, Yeah, it's a different start to the week, so... You've had to get up, especially for this. It's it is nearly midday, and so it uh, must be an early start for you, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Well, I, I, I'm I'm a pretty early riser normally, so this is almost <laughs> afternoon for me. But yeah, it does mean I've had to you know do my hair and yeah you know, put a clean shirt on. So you are looking very dynamic and remarkably tidy, actually. And that's not even even lycra. It's very rare that I see you wearing anything other than lycra. But uh, it's nice to know that you do have a slightly larger wardrobe. Yeah, I thought I'd just try something new for once, you know. First of all, where are you spending lockdown? Where is your little uh, lockdown bunker? So, well, uh, I'm just at my my normal house, as it were. Uh, it's, it's just on the edge. It's kind of on the edge of the New Forest towards Bournemouth. So we're sort of um, quite close to the beach, quite close to the forest. And we've also got uh, like a working forest stuck in between us as well. So... Uh, we've just got lots of gravel tracks and stuff like that on, so it's nice to spend some time in there away from the traffic. So plenty of scope to uh, clear your mind and get out, explore a little bit if uh, if you want to escape the, the weird monotony that is lockdown. Yeah, I mean, for me, I work from home anyway, so that's that's a that's a normal thing for me. So it, it's it's just the little things like, not being able to go to the cafe, not being able to go out with people, uh, not being able to go out for a meal, those those kind of things that mm. uh, get surprisingly used to it quite quickly, though. And like you watch TV and you see people hugging or or going out for a meal, and it seems weird. Now it's um, it's quite strange. I have found myself getting strangely angry while watching TV, saying, keep two metres <laughs> apart. I don't care if this was filmed 12 years ago, but look at those crowds. What are you doing? Yeah, don't shake it's hands. It's madness. <laughs> it's madness. <laughs> I'd like to talk to you, first of all, about Estrella bikes, because that is what you do at the moment. And they are fantastic bikes. Um, very sort of unique. I love the, the paint jobs. I've actually cycled with you. I think the last time we went out, didn't we have some like seven punctures? between us and that was the the last time I ever went out on a bike with you but uh, yeah talk talk to me about Estrella and why you decided to set that up I think I've, I've, I've just always loved bikes I've loved building bikes I've loved designing bikes it's um yeah it's just a passion when something new comes out I like I, I like uh you know overcoming problems on them you know like how how can I make this better and I've done that for as long as I can remember. So, yeah, just being able to sort of e- express myself through my bikes has been has been great. You know, it's sort of I've got in my head what I want to do, I, how I want to change things, what things I want to make, and all that, and and you know how I want the bikes to ride, everything like that. So, so it's, it's, yeah, it's it's been really good fun and. and I do enjoy it uh, more than more more than I thought I would as well. You know, I mean, I thought I was going to enjoy it, but I just really sort of love when a bike's finished. You know, um, and we get people coming to us that that say, "Oh, well, we can't get this done elsewhere, but we'd 
we know what we want can you make this work and so you know when when you've finished a project like like that is yeah it's just really enjoyable and we'll talk about your actual time on the bike a little bit later but um i was looking at the estrella website and saying that it was something that you you'd always sort of wanted to do and you had the idea um a while ago when you were a, a young lad back in the the black and white eras when you're still riding in wearing wool and yeah. and the wheels were made out of wood and stuff but then it was a while between between the the concept and actually putting it into reality yeah it was i mean there is a question in there somewhere yeah uh <laughs> i did work in the trade back uh sort of in my teenage years i worked in a bike shop and i also worked for a um what do you call it an old-fashioned frame frame builder so when frames were steel and they were made to measure and you know uh, all braised together in various different tubings uh, and i worked and i i worked i was training to um spray frames and that coming up with designs mm-hmm. for paint jobs and things like that so so um yeah i don't think i had the skill level for brazing them together stuff like that i don't i don't think i had the patience for that side of things because it was yeah. a, it could be a lot of man hours in mitering joints and things like that these days you just have a machine you just tap in a few numbers and zoom, it just cuts it perfect whereas in the old days it was a long job and these days everything is is custom made at Estrella, isn't it? You you have the frames, you have all the uh, the the paint jobs we were talking about. Everything is is made for the uh, for the client who comes to you with a specific needs, and then you you fit it all out to their requirements. Yeah, that's right. We so depending on where you live, you might or what type of riding you do, you might have some you might just have normal requirements and want something fairly standard. And we do do just standard builds um but even on a standard build we make sure that everything fits you so sometimes you might buy a bike and then you think oh actually i need like a shorter stem or wider handlebars or different length cranks or you want um gear sizes are wrong for me or whatever so so even on a standard build we we do take care of all of that and um, we make sure the bike fits i mean if you went on in, in normal times when pe- people can come and see us, you know, we'd go from the the start of uh, uh, doing a whole bike fit and then going through choosing yeah. which frame is going to be right for you, discuss the different types of components and their pros and cons. I mean, everything's good at the top level. You know, there's not much between stuff and a lot of it comes down to personal preference. But But depending on the type of riding you do, then certain things might, be better than other things in that instance you know so and and like i said earlier we have people coming to us that just want they go to a normal bike shop and they're told no that's a load of that's a stupid idea you can't do that it doesn't work yeah so um you take that stupid idea and make it a reality and showing it can be done yeah (laughs) yeah i think that as soon as you're told it can't be done then it's sort of you know it's that's when you want to do it more and uh yeah we, we, we even had a guy uh fly over from moscow uh for one of our bikes he he flew over he told us what he wanted and we said yeah we could give that a go and uh, he flew over and um he took out a test bike for a day uh rode a local sporty and that said yeah i like it i want it Uh, he flew home we did what he wanted he flew back a couple of weeks later pick up the bike and finish off the fitting and and he he, and then he flew back again so it's like um yeah that that was quite an enjoyable one that was i won't go into the specifics of it because it'll just bore people but but yeah 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 uh, certain but you 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 do also work with people who are local to you in the in the sort of verwood ringwood area you don't have to fly in from uh foreign capital cities to to purchase Estrella, although it, it, it does help obviously yeah i mean if you're local then you don't need to fly out anywhere first and fly back in but um uh yeah you can well in normal times you can just come and see you, us you, 
you you can do if you want yeah. if you want to make it yeah <laughs> yeah why not a bit more special. and in terms of this lockdown period have you noticed that affecting you i think in 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 terms of the bikes and everything yeah uh the first bit was when we first locked down was quite a scary time because it's like we don't know what's going to happen people don't know they've got jobs you know yeah. it's like oh dear um but then there's been like this real boost in cycling and 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 everyone's out exercising even if it's not on a bike they're out walking or jogging or it's we've sort of i suppose the nice weather, weather's helped as well but we've become an outdoor nation and and sort of a lot of the bike sales the real boost i suppose is a bit lower down the price scale than us but there's still been the knock-on effect of, of people yeah. you know emptying their garage of all the old bikes that they thought weren't worth selling and now worth something so so yeah it's um yeah i mean now it, now it's this this quite nice you know we've been fairly fairly busy so um it's just it's just a bit different because there's certain things we can't do we can't have you come here and do a bike fit but but we can have yeah. you come here and pick a bike up you were saying uh, when you were chatting earlier that you had a client who had his own wheels uh well it's normally you provide the whole bike but you a client who's got his own wheels uh but wanted the rest of the bike set up and you were giving a a guided setup tutorial over whatsapp weren't you i think yes that's right yeah it had, um so they wanted a new bike they wanted to go carbon and that but they'd already upgraded their wheels on their on their sort of cheaper bike and uh so they wanted to keep those, but uh, I suppose like time scales, they could have sent the wheels into me and I could have sent them back. But obviously they're, they're yeah. trying to do things as as cost effectively as possible. So it was, I, I had to set the bike up with a set of wheels here, but there are always going to be slight differences, you know, different makes of wheel and hubs. They might be, they don't need to be very different for it to affect the smoothness of the gear changes and, and things like that yeah. so uh yeah they once they got the bike and they put their wheels in there then then we did like a a whatsapp um video call and i and i could run them through i told them in advance what tools they would need there wasn't many tools that they could possibly need but they had them lined out and and it's like right the the screw with the h next next to it if you can just do a quarter turn <laughs> anti-clockwise on that please um things like that and yeah i mean it it took a bit longer than if i was doing it on my own obviously um but it did work so yeah it's different there's a sort of service that you wouldn't necessarily get if you went down to uh, your local bike shop or some of the bigger places if you went down to halfords I'm, i don't think they'd necessarily take the time out to uh, to whatsapp every customer that needed um tweaks doing obviously very different yeah ends of the market but it's nice to be able to provide that sort of service uh to, to customers isn't it yeah at the end of the day we want people to be happy we want people to ride our bikes and and enjoy riding them i'd like to talk to you a bit about your cycling career uh if if that's all right actually because you were you know, a very high level cyclist uh throughout your teens and then had a, an accident which which set you back and um has left you with physical issues and um you retired from cycling when you were quite young I don't, how, how old were you when you ha- had to retire about, about 19 i suppose yeah so uh i've actually had a series of of accidents over the preceding years after that so my first accident i fractured two vertebrae in my neck and i fractured my skull um it led to yeah some dip difficulties especially around sort of longer riding supporting my myself my shoulder um i've just got like one of the muscles in it is is is, is paralyzed so the movement in it is a bit restrictive but more of a pain and annoyance and i i didn't really consider myself necessarily disabled at that time it was just like oh i've had an injury that means i can't do this uh yeah and i think after that a long period of time off trying to recover and at 19 there's lots of um other 
avenues of, of entertainment to to pursue yes so um yeah it, it it wasn't so much necessarily just the the injury that that led to me retiring as as such it was more just being dragged off in other directions i suppose i'd never thought that i was completely away from it you know it's always like oh like this winter i'll start I'll, I'll do the work and I'll be back. Um, and then, like I said, I did have uh, two two more accidents where I'd, where I'd fractured my skull, and it was really after the the third one one of those where I realised I wasn't um, going to recover physically as as yeah. much as I had done before. So, um, and because of seizures and that, I was on. Uh, quite heavy medication for the first 18 months to sort of try and get things into control and yeah you do you're just completely zoned out and um my son had only been born like six months before my my last accident so i think uh, by the time he's sort of 18 months old and and i'll just they're drinking coffee and cake and i was like 94 or 96 kilos so like racing wise i'm 70 kilos so it's that's quite big yeah 90 odd um and yeah i just thought i didn't think about racing or anything like that i just thought it doesn't matter what i achieve i've just got to try because I've, I've got to be an example to him so i've just got to you know I, I wasn't thinking about winning gold medals or anything like that i was just thinking about being more mobile and 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 showing that I was trying, I suppose, rather than just sitting back and letting it happen. So uh, yeah. cycling was all I knew from that side of things. It's also, you know, it's, as you've seen, like on my feet, I'm not that good. Um, and I use sticks and that. So that's the strange thing. That's the thing which always, uh, always felt like you were hustling me when we went out cycling in terms of, um, you know, you'd be on your stick and you'd you'd go over to to your bike and think, oh, here we go. How long is this ride going to take? And you're waiting for Darren. Then all of a sudden, as soon as you get clipped into the pedals, whoosh! And then you're you're waiting for me at the top of the next hill. Um, it's amazing yeah, what you can I achieve. Sat down. Pissed, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's that's the first nugget of wisdom yeah. to be shared in uh, lockdown. It's amazing what you can achieve when you're sat down. So you were inspired first and foremost to get back on your bike because of setting an example to to Brandon. Yeah. Uh, was it what um obviously at some point it got a little bit more serious. You said you weren't thinking about winning gold medals when you got back on the bike, but what was the turning point that made you think you know I want to take this a little bit more seriously again? There's a there's a couple of sort of stages to that I suppose. One was like starting off just riding the bike to lose weight and I was just going out on my own and one day I was just going up and it's like a false flat it was dragging on it was a headwind and I was on my own and I see going the other way I see some people that I knew hadn't seen for five ten years and um, just before that moment I was thinking this bike's going in the bin when I get home and and then I just bumped into them at the right moment and we stopped i turned around i went off with them and then i, I just started riding with them on a real regular basis um you know two three times a week uh that was the first kind of turning point and that kind of encouraged me to get back into racing because there were people i knew from racing so i had lost some weight but i was still pretty big i was still like 85 kilos i suppose and i went out to a race that sort of the circuit is centered on a big hill so you basically you go along the top you drop down you go along the bottom and then you come up the hill and the finish is just over the top of the hill and it's like you know laps of the, i don't know okay 10 mile circuit so I, I i went out to that race and they had um and I'd won on that circuit on a few times in the past, you know, in my previous life. And so I was feeling, oh, I love this circuit. It's great, you know. And But I was probably 85, 86 kilos. And they had like a neutralized zone where you just ride behind the car where they take you out to the circuit. So we had to go up the yeah. hill, but the long way up the hill. So it wasn't the steep 
side that they use in the race. But I got dropped in the neutralized zone. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, yeah, that was quite embarrassing. And that made me just think, well, if I'm going to turn up and race and pay money to race, pay money to have a license, have a race bike, then I think I better do a bit of work, you know. So, so that kind of encouraged me to do the work involved, you know, uh, and just, yeah, instead of just going out on the bike, I, I started training. And, uh, yeah. and then one of the guys that I bumped into, and that he used to run like a, a training camp to Mallorca in, in March every year. And he was, we were talking about my sort of disability and, that. and he was saying, oh, yeah, but I, I, I know this guy that comes out on our training camp. He's got a similar disability to you. And he's on like the national team. And they get like, you know, he's he's full time. He gets supported and he's just got a silver medal in, in Sydney. Um, and, yeah, it's well, why don't you speak to British Cycling? Because, you know, he, you're no slower than he is or anything like that. It's sort of thing you seem like quite a similar sort of level of disability and all that. So that kind of encouraged me to phone up British Cycling and I spoke to Paul West at British Cycling, who was the, the disability coordinator. And he sort of invited me, if you like, or said, well, we've got the national championships coming up next month at Darley Moor on the road. So why don't you come along to that? Um, we'll give you a sort of a temporary classification if you like and um and we'll take things from there and see how it goes and yeah that was that 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 was the start basic basically from there and that was when things started getting serious and what so when was that sort of 2000 and 2002 2003 yeah i'm not very sure now to be honest um but yeah <laughs> sounds awful doesn't it um yeah yeah start off with one one race um i did well in that so they then looked at my times on the track which is what they base most of the things around and yeah so it must have been 2002 and then i yeah and then i started on the team in 2003 where you know based out of manchester the metal factory um yeah and yeah worked on from there i think in 2003 i wrote the um european championships there okay. wasn't a world championships then but what they did was uh at the european championships there was basically two sets of medals so it was an uh, it's an open championship so you don't have to be european to ride it so you've got the americans the russian uh, oh no russia is european um yeah you've got them from all around the world coming and then they do it just happened to be in europe is that yeah it? <laughs> yeah it's like your it's like eurovision cycling contest in terms of yeah we'll get australia in there as yeah, well and, uh, anyone who, who fancies it's it it's something similar but uh, it makes the medal ceremonies very long because um especially if you've got if if you get three europeans getting the medals you've still got two lots of medal ceremonies to go through so first of all you you give the open medals to the people that were actually first second and third yeah. And then you do the European medals for the first, second, and third European. So if they're the same, it sort of it gets a bit strange. Uh, is, is this why you have so many medals? I always work out. It's, again, it's it's strange to see you out of lycra, but it's also strange not to see you wearing your medals. Normally, uh, when I pop round, you always seem to. Oh, I didn't realise you were coming round. Just have. I don't know. I lose track of how many medals. I have to take my socks off to count them. Uh, normally, when you're wearing them, is that is that how? It'll, you you managed to achieve so many uh well, well over your career i think i mean that's that's just on the european ones but yeah it does mean you can come back from like the the european champs you do come back with quite a lot of the things you know 17 times world champion 10 olympic medals six of them gold is that the current yeah that's yeah that sounds takings? about right yes about right, and not many of those have gone on eBay yet. We'll see how the rest of lockdown goes before uh, you start flogging those. Yeah, we can't eat them, so it's yeah, we've got to do something with them. You've won so many 
championships and Olympic races, do you have any sort of highlights that you go, yes, that is a defining moment in my career? Um, it's hard to sort no. of, yeah, no, you don't. Sort of, <laughs> I do have a kind of attitude that like that race is done now. So you just start from zero again for the next race. So I don't tend to dwell too much on stuff. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you how many races I've won or whatever. I don't keep a count or anything like that. It's only like the, the more important things where I sort of keep a tally, if you like. Um, but, but, but there so are certain, world record certain things. record holder as well, were you, I think? Uh, yeah, I think on the track of, we yeah, have held world records, I think, at every distance. So I don't know. Not not now, I doubt. But um, you, you, you you lose track, don't you, when you, you know, if you've got one world record, you may as well have 100 world records. So it's it's just focusing on the next. <laughs> they they, they <laughs> were the at the time. Goal, it's, it? um, it's not what you're working towards, if you saw what I mean. It's, it's kind of like a, a, a nice little bonus on the side so so you, you, yeah it, it does sort of get just pushed into the background a bit you don't sort of stop and think about it it's not like when you're setting a world record for the guinness book of records or something that's what your that's what your focus is you know so it's um whereas when it's when it's sport you're not really with the exception of the hour record yeah. which is like there isn't an event the hour it's it is specifically a an attempt on a record so that's 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 the exception and that's um i think from the time when i grew up cycling the hour record was quite big it was um it had been held for a long time by the the legendary eddie Merckx, and then we get mm -hmm. francesco moser come along and his technology basically to to break the record uh, so it was so it's quite a big thing and then we had the obrie and boardman as well yeah, I was going to say riding on, bits so, of yeah washing machines. homemade bikes made out of washing machines. That remember that being all over the news when I was getting into cycling when I was younger. Yeah, I think that's that's made it. I mean, it was it was quite a big thing to me. And so when I found out that there was actually a paracycling hour record, so that was it. Yeah, I I thought that's something I, I wanted to do, and I've done. I did an aero record where you use the same bike as you would in a in a pursuit on the track with the the funny handlebars and the disc okay. wheels um and then and then the governing body the uci they they came up with this plan that they didn't want technology being used to break records so they they renamed it and they called it the athletes hour record and they basically set eddie Merckx's 1972 record was the benchmark for bike technology so right. round tubes, spoked wheels, shallow rims, uh, standard handlebars, you know, curly dropped handlebars, all of that. Yeah. So, so when that, so when when they changed the rules to that, that was like, yeah, and I, and I saw like board boardman just about managed to break Eddie's record, um, and that was quite an exciting thing. As much as yeah. watching someone around ride around in circles for an hour is can be exciting you know that was that was definitely some something that inspired me to to have a crack at that myself and 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 that was that was really good because you're still although um you've got to use that old technology if you like we still got a lot of things that we know now that we didn't know then in terms of sort of aerodynamics and bike positioning mm -hmm. and clothing and things like that so you're still you're still looking for those gains and and it's one of the only things I've kept from my cycling career is the frame that I used. Um, so it was built by Terry Dolan um, and very different design. Although it looks like a standard track frame, it, it's actually it's actually like really, really long. So you can get a more yeah. stretched out. Yeah. And, then a, yeah, and on top of that, I used a really long stem and then very narrow handlebars. So I was like, yeah, get myself as long and narrow as I, as I could. And that, that, that was, um, ultra streamlined. It was certainly an so, interesting um, event yeah. to do and probably the most uncomfortable and, and difficult and painful experiences on a bike that I've ever had. So 
we know that you've overcome huge adversity when you had your accidents and got back into cycling and had to lose all the weight and get back on, you know, get back on the bike and get back into a, a fighting fit shape. But were there any moments where you thought, actually, no, I can't do this. This isn't for me. Yeah, I think, I mean, we all have bad days, don't, don't we? And, and yeah, there's, there's, there's different things. Like, I, I mean, to start with, it was like an issue of balance and that. So my balance is affected quite a lot now. Um, I, I can get around that because of the level that I had beforehand. If you see what I mean in terms of yeah. bike skill. So, I, yeah, I've lost a lot of skill. I'm not as good at going around corners and things like that. Um, I mean, some, some of that comes with age as well. You know, you, you, you get a little bit less gun ho I suppose. Um, and that, but yeah. And then learning, I mean, it, it, it sounds strange because on a bike, it, every, every, everything looks like any other bike rider. Um, but I'm having to, to relearn how to pedal. So most of my condition is about muscle control and muscle tone. So although my left leg is has got the strength there you know if i push if i push with both legs together you know it's it's fine but trying to push down while the other leg is coming up i don't have that control and also yeah it makes it want to turn to the side so essentially if i push down with my left leg it unclips my foot so um, but it's good at coming back up out of the way. So it's learning. I am using the left leg a bit, but very, very little. We did some research in the laboratory with a, um, you know, double-sided power meters with measuring everything and at different intensities and how much work each leg was doing, you know, and it was, it was yeah, it was, it was quite surprising just to see how little it's actually doing. But I suppose if I get to a really, really steep hill and, you know, you're going really slow and you're in too big a gear and I can't not push down then and then I just end up like unclipping my foot or something. It's, uh, so yeah, you're sort of like, it's just relearning ev- ev- everything really. Um, and yeah, so there was at the start, it's like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to ride in a bunch even, you know, it's sort of like that kind of thing. So, and in, in terms of the sort of the mental side of that, the psychological side of things, when you you found yourself in that situation where you're getting frustrated or you knew that the, your training maybe wasn't going as well as you wanted or even just the fact of having to relearn to ride a bike properly, how did you cope with that from a psychological point of view? Did you have special tricks and techniques that work for you? Yeah, I mean, I've got a few sort of, things from a sporting point of view if you like um of how i deal with um the pressure say before a race and also when things aren't going quite so well so on a race day situation the track is the easiest one to control but i basically i i have a very set warm-up routine and that so i think the fear anxiety is just about not knowing the outcome basically. So when I think, well, yeah, in two hours time, I will know the outcome. So that's covered, you know, and, and then yeah. Yeah, and then I get into that. As long as I do something where I've got total control leading up to it, I don't have to worry about what's going on in the race. I know, right, that in a minute's time, I'm going to change up a gear and keep working on the turbo, doing the warm up, you know, I know that my my, my helmet, towel, everything is there ready. It's all lined out there. And, and I'm just going to go through this routine. And then that's going to take me to the line. And then after that, well, whatever happens, happens. Um, and I, I think from a when things go wrong perspective, I think I have um, technique. I think they call it the what if technique. So you you kind of have a set place where you go if you like so um a place where you start so it's like kind kind of like if you're doing a word search um one yeah. of those squares and you think right i'm going to go back to the center now i've lost it i can't find what it is go back to the center or go back to the 
top right corner or whatever you know have a place where you you start from and everything so so yeah it's sort of like a place where i can compose myself again you know and just not think about what's happening but think about the the, the way forward from it so but i think what hap- what helped more than anything is um is having the right people around you and the people that you can turn to so nobody likes criticism i suppose uh but if you've got somebody whose opinion you value and you feel is honest and everything like that then it's it's easier to take and if they say you need to take it down a notch or you're doing this wrong or whatever then um yeah it's you know someone that you can turn to and say this is all falling apart what what do i do you know um so someone that you've got the trust there because um if you just read it up on google oh you should do that you you, you start doing it and some some sometimes things have to get worse to get better <laughs> so when things start getting worse you, you then lose faith in what you're doing so whereas when it's someone that you trust and and everything's so my coach gary brick brickley is like he was always the one there i knew if he told me to do something i had total faith that it was going to work whereas google often comes back with mixed results if you if you put in a you know a question and you wait that question you can find uh, answers to support or or go against whatever you're you're thinking yeah and I, yeah uh, I think. it's interesting that that joins sorry darren yeah. um during your sort of pro cycling era and working toward races and trying to achieve goals um i think in the current situation that we're in at the moment when it is uncertain uh, but yet people still want to be able to have some sort of control i think that sort of technique the the things you mentioned there where control the controllables focus on what you can control and not worry about it knowing that the outcome will happen whatever just focus on on what you can control and then if things do go wrong then knowing where to reset from yeah. and knowing that you having to take a couple of steps back and also having as you said someone that you can trust to talk things through because i know it's been weird this is the first pandemic i've ever lived through yeah. hopefully it will be the last um as in hopefully we won't have any more pandemics for the next <laughs> however long I'm hoping. (laughs) Yes. Anyway, let's not go down that morbid route. Um, But I think, yeah, definitely having, having that support structure and someone that you can talk things through and who can put you in your place because everyone loves to hear, um, you know, positive stuff, but being able to have genuine negative or constructive criticism is, is invaluable, isn't it really? And I think that applies at, in professional sport and also from day-to-day life yeah i think we all it's amazing when you 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 have something in your head that's so important and you bounce around and it sounds so um right and then you when you speak it out loud to somebody and you think actually that just sounds like total shite you know <laughs> and it's like um yeah so that does help somewhat you know just to <laughs> Even be in a room on your own and speak it out loud and think, does that actually sound like the ramblings of a sane person? You know, it's, um, it's... Yeah, and more often than not, it it doesn't when you actually say it out loud. No, no it's, uh, <laughs> yes, I do find more and more often, I think, that it doesn't make sense. And cycling's a, a weird sport anyway in terms of a lot of people view it as a, a very individual sport. And when you are on the bike, you are in control of the bike itself and also track cycling is often what you see is just the individual side but it is very much a team sport as well whether that's riding in a team in a in a tour uh, and being you know discussing tactics working out tactics working on even things like slipstreaming when you were at the Paralympics and you were supported by the whole you know team GB how does that environment that sort of team atmosphere affect you as a person I think, I mean, looking back on it now, you you go into this place and and you've got one one job to do. That's it, and and anything you else that you do that isn't that is is stuff you shouldn't be doing in a way. You know, so um, down to the, it sounds like you there's a danger of you becoming almost prima donna ish in a way but it's kind of like like well 
I'm here to pedal the bike, not to pump up the tires. Now, in a normal environment, that would be <laughs> that would come across quite badly, you know. But but in that environment, there's somebody there to do that. There's somebody there to pump up the tires. So and use doing things that I'm not supposed to be doing is not right. You know, if I'm pumping up tires and I do my back in, that's four years down the pan, not just of my work, but lots of other people's work. So, so it's quite a yeah. strange thing. And, and, and to get out of that mentality when you leave is the secret. I think, I mean, it's quite hard to get into that mentality first because you feel that you're helping them by doing things that, that, that you can do yourself. Yeah. I can do that myself. It doesn't matter, but it, it's not, really helping the overall goal but it takes away your focus from your you're, you're a just one cog in the machine yeah uh, really aren't you yeah and is that why ever since retiring are you been riding on flat tires <laughs> yeah yeah I've, I've been thinking about solid. these have been flat for weeks <laughs> it's so uncomfortable <laughs> you just can't get anyone to come around and do them anymore so uh, yeah no it's uh it's certainly a very strange life for those few weeks you know you are um you're suddenly put up on this pedestal and it's almost like you're saying right i'm better than everyone else and i'm going to prove it by winning this medal or whatever so there's sort of quite a an air of arrogance about it almost i suppose but 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 you have to believe that because you know self-doubt is 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 not a great thing to have going in there you have to just believe that things are going to go to plan and you are going to win um, that's what you've spent your in you know most of your life going towards so and how did you find the balance as well uh coming from a an ex professional rugby background i used to have real trouble if my life was 100% rugby um if you know i'd have to switch off have to find some other outlet just to clear my brain in order to be able to dedicate 100% of my attention to the rugby when I was on the field or in on you know in the, on the training pitch but other people are completely different did you find that you needed to escape cycling from time to time or did you live breathe eat cycling and that was that worked for you I think it, it's that's quite a difficult one to sort of explain but like there's cycling and there's cycling so to escape okay. cycling as the professional sport type working towards a goal you go out and you just enjoy riding your bike somewhere nice without any um you know you take the computer off your handlebars that's that's showing you everything you don't wear a watch whatever you just go out and you ride and when you feel like stopping you stop and if you want to go hard you go hard and if you don't you don't and you 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 use that that is your escape but so um, as opposed to you know riding around on the track and having to ride at a certain pace or a certain time or do this do that you know um, yeah just I just take the pressure off it yeah I used to like to take away the structure so although I liked the structure from a um, sort of progression point of view to get me to where I wanted to be there's times when you just need to just go away from that from that structure and just be able to do what you want. And um, I'm a big fan of the coffee stop, even I know. training. I know um, that very well. <laughs> a lot of a lot of people uh, against it, and you know, I'm a, um, yeah, I suppose I used to enjoy a lot of banter. I suppose with the the others when we're out on that type of ride, some people were more serious than others. I think. Um, don't have to be outwardly serious to be inwardly serious. You know, it's sort of you, you, you take it. This is your life and everything. That doesn't mean you can't have a, a joke and a laugh along the way. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't want to do it if it wasn't like that because it's supposed to. Ultimately, I started riding a bike because I enjoyed it, not because I wanted to win a gold medal. You know, so um, yeah, ultimately you have to find a way to to make that bit work you know it's it's yeah it's just not it's it's not all about the gold and i don't think i could be less competitive 
now if I tried, you know, I, I, I don't have, I go out on the bike yeah. if, yeah, if I feel like if everyone lights it up going up a hill, if I feel like trying to keep up, I will. And if I don't feel like it, I don't, I don't, I don't mind that I get dropped or whatever. I don't, there's no <laughs> ego there or competitiveness or anything like that. I'm just like, yeah, fine. Well, they'll wait for me anyway, because uh, we're all stopping at the coffee stop anyway. So, but other times then I want to go for it and you think right now, you know, so it's just, um, yeah, it's just going yeah. back to enjoying it. And how are you finding, and how are you finding the balance um, during lockdown? Uh, for example, I know you, you work from home anyway, and it's very easy to get very absorbed if you're building a bike or creating whatever you're, you're doing at the time. Um, what are your normal outlets um, when, when you're at home or when you're when you're working? I think at the moment, so um, I was 50 earlier this year and as a exciting project or whatever and to sort of kick myself into gear to sort of uh, do something. I'd, um, I'd entered the, um, a race called the Transcontinental, which is... Oh, so you have to dress up as a woman. Yes. Is it that one? Not quite, but almost. But it's basically, it's self-supported. It, it starts in Brest, funnily enough, in, okay. in, in north. I won't ask where it finishes. In then. northwest, <laughs> in northwest uh, <laughs> France, and it goes all the way. It finishes in Burgas in Bulgaria. So oh, wow. It's, uh, and, and it's unsupported. So you basically, you find your own route. There's checkpoints along the way. And although it's an unsupported event, that would kind of cancel me out because I'd find it quite difficult to jump off the bike and run into a shop to buy some more drinks or whatever you know um yeah so i, I do need a little bit of help but i found out that there was a pairs category in it so you ride as a pair um so i'm due to be doing that with uh laurie pestana who um she rode for us a couple of years ago and uh, she's actually yeah. at university in oxford now so um her racing career has taken a bit of a back seat to her education and she wanted to do something different as well so so when i'm not doing estrella type bikes or whatever i'm i'm finding that this is a whole new world for me i know nothing about ultra endurance cycling and stuff like that so um, is that sticking panniers on as well then is it carrying everything with oh yeah you, on you the need bike? to carry everything because yeah you you essentially yeah you we might sleep rough or we might find somewhere to sleep, but it's all got to be available to everyone. And so, yeah, you've got to, and, and, and you have to cycle the whole way. You know, you can't get a taxi to the bike shop to get something fixed. If you do that, you've got to get a taxi all the way back to where you back broke down the, yeah. and carry on riding from there. So, um, or ride back there or whatever. So, um, yeah, learning the rules of that, but learning about things like dynamos and lighting and, charger packs and oh, yeah. stuff like that something i it just it's a whole new world re really and i sort of see it almost as a different sport so um yeah just been so you have to relearn to ride the bike again for a third time just because it's just completely different one of the big issues is carrying my sticks because it's going to take it's about four thousand kilometers so it's it's going to take close to two two weeks so I, i'm you know i, I can't yeah. um just go away without my sticks. I'm going to be uh, even more limited than I will be anyway. So um, yeah, you need some sort of transformer bike, don't you? That uh, you press a button and goes and turns into a a walking walking stick or a couple of walking sticks, and then press a button again, it turns back into a uh, endurance cycling machine. Maybe maybe get Rob to uh, have a look at that on the engineering side. I'm going so working on a few I'll, designs. <laughs> Yeah, obviously, then put a fancy paint job on it, and it'll be uh, it'll be sorted. Yeah, we have flown through this podcast. We are very nearly at the end of it. Um, do you have any words of wisdom for people during this lockdown period before we go? Uh, no, <laughs> um, no, uh, okay. no. Uh, <laughs> I suppose lockdown is different for everybody. It, it's affecting your life differently. My life's not changing that much. Other people it's a whole new world. Some people are 
like the stresses of trying to work from home. Other people are like, wow, this is great. I'm furloughed. I'm getting paid and I'm out riding my bike all day. So, so it, your lockdown is very individual to yourself, isn't it? And you have to look at not read online 10 tips to survive lockdown or stuff like that because it's it, it's about you and you're the only one that can get you get you through it so you know um like i said earlier find someone you trust someone whose opinion you value and that use them as a sounding board and maybe maybe be that person for someone else you know and um yeah and just remember it it is going to end you know it's not this isn't a forever i think it's a good opportunity to look at your life in general and think like which bits am i not missing you know which bits can i take out and what can i replace them with you know is that you know it's um it's a time for everything i mean if you went into politics you'd see all sorts of things changing in the world at the moment i've never i don't remember a time when everything has been changing so much and so quickly so i think it's a good i you know it's a good time to look at yourself with yourself a real vss yeah yeah proper mot but in in the meantime control the controllables as you're saying when you were preparing for races but then actually do look at the opportunities um that lockdown does present yeah i think that's, you, i think that's a useful takeaway from this it's easy to say like don't worry about the things that you can't control but but that is kind of what you have to do if, if, if you can't change it then then go with it you know and um, just focus on the things that you can control so um and obviously buy it buy, buy a new bike as well is and buy a new bike that's the biggest message yes. and uh yeah, if you do want to check out the Estrella bikes, they are fantastic. I'll be posting links all over the place for that. And you, well, you, you've seen who you'll be dealing with if you go through Estrella. Uh, you don't get much more experience uh, when it comes to cycling and uh, and bike setups. So please do check out uh, Estrella bikes if you are in the in the market to treat yourself to something so something shiny and carbon, which will make you go faster and look cooler. Thank you. Um, Darren, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you it's really nice to have a catch up we must get out and uh have a race to a coffee shop at some point uh in the near future when when restrictions are uh, relaxed slightly but in the meantime i wish you all the best for the rest of lockdown and i hope to catch you soon thanks very much Robin. this is a lockdown booty call